Good afternoon. My name is Solène Collin, and on behalf of LuxFlag, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the next session of the LuxFlag Sustainable Investment Week. I'm pleased to introduce this session today on country engagement, another credible road to impact, hosted by DPAM. The group Peter Kam Asset Management is a leading asset management firm with over 20 years of experience is an innovative pioneer in responsible and sustainable investing. For that, I'm pleased we have with us today Ophélie Mortier, Chief Sustainable Investment Officer at DIPAM, with over 20 years of experience in the industry. Ophélie, the floor is yours. So good afternoon. I'm uh, very pleased to be here in the heart of the uh, sustainable finances because um, I see a lot of uh, key messages in uh, just a few minutes ago with, uh, with the document and some key words that I uh, like particularly, notably transition, notably uh, engagement, notably daring. And I think that regarding uh, engagement with countries, it's also to dare to uh, engage with those because uh, you will um, see very rapidly that it's a quite different story and quite different animals, if I may say, uh, compared to engaging with corporates. And the key question of finally with who we have to engage, uh, how we have to engage, about what we have to engage, and the key question, which is a key question as well with the companies, is when could we consider that we are impactful, that we are, um, that we are successful? So first of all, um, I would like to insist on the uh, sovereign asset class. As uh, I assume all of you are very busy with the regulation for the moment, we speak a lot about taxonomy, we speak about, a lot about uh, SFDR, the uh, Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation, and you have probably noticed how the sovereign bonds are really not covered by all this regulation. And I think this is a pity, because uh, if you look at the chart, you see the importance of the asset class in terms of financial means, but also in terms of a very stable pocket of all the institutional portfolios. The SDGs that we speak a lot uh, over the last years, when we speak about impact, when we speak about ESG, when we speak about impact to society, I kindly remind that those were the followers of the minimum goals, and these were, has been set up specifically for the countries. So there are important needs in terms of financing, we all know, for the climate transition and for a fair transition for climate, and I think it's a pity if we could not invest in sovereign bonds as sustainable instruments, because this is a very important asset class. Of course, to have an impact, it's not just investing and buying some bonds issued by sovereign or issued by corporates. It's much more than that, and engagement is a full part of a systematic and rigorous approach to ESG. If you look all the journey we have uh, accomplished in terms of sustainable investments with the corporates, but also afterwards with the countries, and notably since 2007 for DPAM, we see how engagement has taken a lead place in the different approaches. It's far away the, um, the time when we use only exclusions, when we use only best in class. Engagement has taken a leading room in this uh, SOI approach and SOI philosophy, and it's very important that it makes part of the global picture. And this is valid for corporates, but this is also valid for sovereigns. If we want to have an impact by investing in sovereign bonds, we fully agree that a sovereign bond is not de facto a sustainable instrument. But when it is uh, engraved in a very disciplined process, which is based on four main drivers that you can see here, there is absolutely a chance that a sustainable bond is a sustainable instrument. But this requires, first of all, a rigorous ESG screening, and I will have a word about this in a few minutes. 
Of course, also the impact instruments, the use of proceeds, but meaning through a rigorous monitoring of these, a green bond is not de facto a green bond. That requires a rigorous monitoring of the different aspects, notably in terms of pre-agreement information and post-agreement information, exactly as SFDR is requiring from us. The SDGs contribution analysis, and as I said, the SDGs have been created for the countries, not for the corporates, first of all for the countries. So it's important that if you screen the different countries based on their sustainability, you can prove that you capture all these different challenges. And last but not least in the topic of today, the efficient engagement. As I said, it's a totally different animal. It's challenging to engage, but it's not because it's not perfect today that we should not do anything. If we thought about this in 2007, when we started the first model regarding sustainability at country level, we would, not, we would have not dared to create and to set up the question of sustainability regarding country. Nevertheless, we created the model in 2007 and we decided to set up a strategy linked to this model already in 2008. When we did the same for the emerging economies, we received also not criticism, but a lot of um, questions and skepticism regarding this because we said we received a lot of remarks saying that emerging economies and sustainability, that's too premature today to combine both worlds. In 2013, we dared to do it through a model that we all know that it's not perfect model, but when you define appropriate rules, you can set something which is credible in terms of portfolio management and in terms of ESG impact. Because that's really the objective of DPAM, combining sustainable and performance. It's still a broad concept, uh, but as I said, it's not a reason not to do anything. So first of all, because states are important economic actors, and that's also a reason why we I would say a bit lobby uh, for government bonds being a sustainable instrument because it's also a way to put the states in front of their responsibilities regarding financing the transition to low carbon economy. Secondly, I remind that several countries and almost three-fourths of the world has committed to net zero emission and to the Paris alignment by 2050, which is already in 25, 35 years maximum. And as we already mentioned several times, climate is important, but it should not be more important than the two other dimensions, the social and the governance dimension, meaning that climate is important, but the fair transition, including the social challenges, is also important. Regarding engagement with country, it can cover different channels, different topics, different ways. Uh, first of all, it could be engaging dialogue just to gain a in bit insight around ESG questions because, as I said, the information and research regarding ESG for countries remains quite limited today. So it's, uh, first of all, a way to gain more information about ESG questions that you might have. Secondly, it's also a way to encourage ESG data transparency and data disclosure. Increase awareness regarding increasing ESG appetite of investors. I can assure you that when we started the dialogue regarding ESG, we have still a lot of questions from the different stakeholders uh, we have in front of us. Because the first key point finally is to say, guys, even in sovereign bonds, we are very attentive to ESG challenges. So it's not because it's a government bond that we will buy it as such. All these aspects of ESG are as important as for you as for the companies. And a last objective is also pursuing issuers by promoting sustainable economic, social and environment outcomes because it's a win-win situation for both uh, sides of the discussion.
Voilà, it's better. <laughs> there is still a lot of prejudice regarding uh, engaging with sovereigns. Huh? The first of all is a bit like interfering in the uh, governance um, action and governance decisions. So it could be perceived a bit like politically sensitive. Why? I think it's not at all, because as I said, it's full part of the ESG integration. You have also the question of investment size and what we call the Calimero complex. Now we are a very small, um, a very small bond holders, generally speaking, when we buy the uh, debt of different countries. Nevertheless, it's not a reason, uh, once again, not to do anything. If you look at what's happening on the corporate size, and with notably all these aspects of shareholder responsibility and voting action, you see over the years how effective and efficient it can be to express your voice during the AGM. It's exactly the same with the country. The more we will speak, the more we will require information, transparency, disclosure, and the better the results we will get. Of course, it's always a long time process, but we have to start with something. Important also is the rise of passive investing, very important in corporates, but also very important in sovereign bonds. A lot of investors finally invest through trackers when we speak about sovereign bonds, so they do not really have this uh, action to this uh, opportunity to engage dialogue with the different stakeholders alongside the value chains. That's also the role of the active asset managers such as DPAM. We have a responsibility to uh, to transfer the message to those uh, bond issuers. And last uh, reason not to do anything is the evocation of it's not necessary for the developed market because, you know, in terms of risk and opportunities, we have a good coverage, so it's not necessary. Of course, it is necessary because notably in terms of climate, as you have maybe heard from the different experts we've, we have in our committee regarding sustainability of country, climate does not stop at frontiers. It's really a global challenge and it will be a key topic this year at the COP27 in Egypt regarding these uh, relationships between emerging and developed markets. We have all a roles to play in this, including the developed market. So maybe in terms of ESG information, you might think that you know everything, which is probably not the case, but there is also a key question regarding uh, climate. So that's the reason why we have to do something, even if we are in a totally imperfect world. How to do this? That's another key question. And as I already mentioned, a first key question is finally with whom we should discuss. Um, we organized last week our sixth edition of the sustainability seminar about uh, engagement, a first round table regarding engagement with corporates and a second one regarding engagement with countries. And in this round table, we have notably Serge de Gelderre, which is who is sorry, the CEO of the Climate Affair in Belgium. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but Climate Affair or Climatzak um, is an organization which suited several governments for lack of ambitions regarding climate. According to him, we should, uh, to, have an act, to have an effect, we should directly dialogue with the systemic persons regarding the ambitions of country, meaning the prime ministers or these kind of heads of governments. You can imagine um, easily that we do not have always access to the prime ministers of the different uh, countries. But our key conviction is to engage as much as you have the opportunity to engage, meaning that we engage with all the different stakeholders alongside the value chain. It could be, the, I would say, the technicians regarding the uh, sovereign bonds issues, exactly as we do, for example, in New Zealand. New Zealand is preparing a new green bond, and we are really in an engaging dialogue, almost a sort of workshop, where we discuss what we expect exactly in terms of green bonds to be considered as a green bond. And that's rather with some, I would say, technicians from the uh, bond issuance uh, organization. We are 
based in Brussels, in the heart of the European institutions, that offers also a lot of opportunities in terms of meetings, in terms of uh, uh, people coming to the institutions. And for example, and we will see afterwards uh, the case, but we had also the Minister of Energy from Mongolia in the offices because he should intervene in a conference on energy at the European Commission. And that was also a great opportunity. In that case, we do not discuss about all the technical details regarding green bonds because they have not yet issued any green bond. The first, um, the first objective was, as I said, first of all, raise the awareness about the importance of ESG for sovereign bondholders as well for this universe, raise awareness about the importance of climate and raise awareness about the efficiency of such instruments like green bonds or uh, sustainability linked bond. So, we will try to dialogue with all the peoples alongside the value chain to have the bigger impact as possible. And as mentioned regarding developed economies versus emerging economies, when we engage with countries such as uh, Mongolia, it could be perceived a bit like, uh, I would say, imperialism. Uh, from these Western uh, people saying what you have to do with coal, uh, while we all know that we use a lot of coal uh, several years ago. But nevertheless, I think we have to remain very humble when we present the results of our country model. We insist on the fact that it's not at all a perfect model. We know the weaknesses of the model, but we know as well the key messages it can uh, give to our uh, audience and our public. And and so the idea is not to give lessons. The idea is, as François Germain mentioned during our round table, is really uh, sharing experiences, trying to avoid that uh, these kind of countries do not repeat the same mistakes as, as, as we did. If they can already uh, go a step further and do not pass through all the same path regarding a uh, low carbon economy, it could be already also um, a win and a gain in terms of uh, engagement. Because as I said, and that's some illustration of uh, what I've just said regarding climate, we. We think all the time about China as a key, uh, a key emitting uh, country, but it's also very important to uh, put that into perspective in terms of also emissions by inhabitant. And sometimes the story it could be quite different from what we think. And that's also the remark we had regarding climate. Climate does not stop at frontier, so it's really a global commitment. So it's important that we engage with all countries, be it the emerging economies or be it the developed market. How to engage with uh, sovereigns? Um, in the past, we said, yeah, we engage with sovereigns because, first of all, we try to make uh, as much as possible knowledge about the model we have developed and the impact this model has on our portfolio construction. And secondly, we discuss each time we meet with the, uh, with the uh, International Monetary Fund, with central bank representatives, with different representatives from ministers because our portfolio managers uh, do a lot of um, research trips we systematically uh, dialogue with uh, those stakeholders. That's important, these ESG conversations, I would say. But more important is to have defined a clear systematic and um, systematic and formalized engagement. And so the big difference is when you have decided to, to make the bridge and say, OK, now I will systematically engage on sovereign, with sovereign issues on the different aspects on ESG, and I commit to have a certain percentage coverage in terms of uh, engagement with the countries I am invested in. And that makes a big difference because, as I said, all these ESG conversations are certainly useful, particularly to know more about ESG challenges of the countries. But if we want to get impact, if we want to get result, we have to go a step further. The same with writing letters. Huh? We are also committed and engage in different big statements 
means that you can see, for example, the principles for responsible, responsible investment back, back, backed by the United Nations. They also organize big statements, big letters, formal letters you can send to the different uh, officials, notably the G7 or the G20. But finally, you could also uh, uh, raise key questions about the real impact, the real efficiency of such um, of such channels. So that's why for us the big difference will be to systematically and formally engage with the different persons you can meet to get all the information regarding ESG information. And this is a concrete illustration of what we do at DPAM because as I said, we have developed already uh, since 2007 a model regarding the sustainability of country and we can say one word about this. But the model will focus on four main dimensions that you can see here. First of all, the question of the G, the governance, is recapped by transparency and democratic values. You have, of course, the driver of environment. And the social driver is split in two because we consider that you have in the sustainable development definition, notably from the Brutland report already in 1987, it's clearly meeting the current needs of the current populations whilst not compromising the needs of the future generation. So the current generation is capped by the uh, driver population, healthcare and wealth distribution, and the next generation is capped by education. So on those different dimensions, we have selected uh, a certain number of indicators provided from, providing from different um, recognized sources, World Bank, uh, F FMI, um, the, the World Health Organization, some NGOs, and the idea is to assess the sustainability of the different countries we cover, and each time in the perspective of a peer comparison. And with this model, we have some uh, scores for each country we can invest, and this is what you see with Mongolia. As I said, we know that there are some weaknesses because the model is purely quantitative. We do not rely on some assessment or some qualitative aspects we could think about the country. So meaning that sometimes you cannot reduce everything in a single matrix, that's the key change we have with uh, SFDR, I think. And it's always in uh, a relative comparison. So it's sometimes we also um, look at the improvement, the progress countries uh, make regarding these different indicators, but it's the progress compared to the others. So of course, the lower you are uh, in terms of different indicators, the higher chance you can make progress compared to those who are already at the top of the ranking. But nevertheless, uh, knowing these different um, aspects and and key criteria of this model. This is something as a starting point of the discussion we have with the different people regarding um, sovereign engagement. So first of all, uh, we insist on the fact that this is very important for us, ESG, notably in the countries. We explain what we look and we explain also uh, where the country score quite well and where there is visibly uh, some margins for improvement and typically you see for Mongolia we could raise the question about environment. When we think about Mongolia we think about this big uh, landscape with steps and, and, and nothings, uh, nothing on the horizon but uh, nevertheless the, the, the capital city is particularly uh, polluted and there is a big challenge of uh, shifting from uh, coal to a less uh, emitting uh, um, energy. So that's this kind of conversation we had with uh, the Minister of Energy in Mongolia. And the next step was, of course, uh, regarding the options to issue a green bond, because green bonds as investors, we will require more and more this kind of use of proceed bonds because for us, it's very clear its impact. We know what we finance compared to uh, traditional sovereign bond. And for them, I'm sure that it's also a win-win situation because as there is more and more demand for this kind of products and this kind of instruments, they have also a higher chance to get success on the, uh, on the primary market when they issue uh, their sovereign bonds. So that's the, um, the starting point of our discussion and that's what we have committed to. We have committed to have this discussion with all the countries we are invested in our different portfolios. 
The, the scorecard is based uh, on a model, so the model we developed already in 2007 and a strategy linked to that already in 2008. And as mentioned, this is based on the Brutland report. And we started from this definition because I kindly remind that in 2007, nothing uh, existed regarding data for countries. So we had to dare to do this. And if you remember as well, 2007, 2008, it was still this paradise of a free risk assets such as the German Bund or such as uh, the, the French OET. So we were in a completely different uh, universe this, as today because at that time still you have a lot of AAA countries and so on and afterwards you had the famous crisis of, uh, of Euro. So it was really interesting to already set up a model regarding country at that time because we have already faced several crises uh, since the inception of this, um, of this model. Uh, the, the, the key principles on the model, I already touched a word about this, but we want to avoid any subjectivity to the sustainability of country. Otherwise, when we show the, when we show the, the, the ranking of the different universe, we have all the time remarks, yes, but I know very well the situation in this country. I do not understand why Tunisia is less cold than uh, Morocco to say something. So that's the reason why we want to remain as objective as possible. So only quantitative metrics and also very important quantitative comparable and from indisputable with, uh, so but also very important is the uh, composition of uh, the board we have regarding this um regarding this, um, this model. So it's a model we discuss every six months with uh, official board and to uh, remind that DPAM is a financial expert. We are an expert in asset management. We're not necessarily an expert in biodiversity or in climate or in social issues. And that's the reason why we have a formal committee to help us to define the criteria, the things we have to look, and we, um, who help us as well in terms of engagement uh, to review notably this question of, I would say, imperialism in our uh, discussions. Next to the permanent uh, invitees, we have uh, also uh, key persons that we invite on a case-by-case -case basis when we want to improve uh, or when, when we want to fine-tune uh, some key topics like education or social. Do not have the same. So we can uh, also wonder now with whom we have already a uh, question. We could also ask the, the why we know, but finally on what we should uh, engage. Should we engage only on the Paris Agreement? Should we engage on, on key topics to have more impact? That's also a key question. SDGs are generally used as a framework in terms of engagement with companies or in terms of uh, assessing impact, so we could also raise the question whether this should be a framework for engaging with countries. But as I said, uh, for some it's, it should be very, um, very prioritized. Huh? It should be only climate or as the, um, the economist mentioned, ESG is finally only E emissions. Uh, that's not our uh, choice. Why? Because as I said, it will really depend on who you have front of you to discuss. When you have New Zealand, you can go into very detailed uh, discussions regarding green bonds. When you have somebody like the Minister of Energy from Mongolia, it will be rather a key broad discussion about ESG challenges. So it's um, for us, of course, the more you uh, prioritize and you focus on key topics, uh, the more you are focused and maybe you will get uh, impact. But I think that we are at the inception of uh, engaging with countries. So it's first of all raising awareness and gaining more and more uh, information in a mutual exchange of uh, information to be efficient. We have to start with something and that's uh, why we should not uh, be too uh, focused or too narrow focus on specific topics and forgetting all the uh, rest of the uh, different challenges. 
So we will refer as well to the SDGs because um, notably these SDGs help us to be sure that our model is always relevant. As already mentioned, we uh, review this model every six months. It's not just updating the data we have in the model. It's all the time putting into question the relevancy of the model, whether it captures the ESG challenges it has to capture. Because we created this model in 2007, we speak about medium long term challenges, but nevertheless, a lot is changing and fast changing. So it's very important to remain alert to be sure that this model is relevant. So the model predates the SDG. There were no SDGs when we set up the model, but nevertheless, it help us to see whether we have not missed anything. And the, uh, the, the next slides I will not always comment, but it's also to insist how it is important and how it is a quite standardized, internationally recognized framework in terms of progress for the country. So of course, we will never see, uh, we will never check whether it's because we have invested in this country that we have improved and contributed to some progress regarding SDGs, but nevertheless, it's important to keep an eye on this and keep an eye on the progress to see also what could be key topics you want to engage with countries, because we have to recognize that the uh, COVID and the lockdowns as a result have unfortunately um, had um, sad, sad results regarding SDGs, because on several topics and several uh, key issues, like notably end of poverty, we saw a lot of backwards, um, backwards efforts in terms of, uh, of progress. And it's the same regarding, so it's some illustration just for information, but sometimes I think it's also important to uh, remind the, the, the global picture. The same regarding the health, which is also a key driver of the model, because you see as well that the COVID crisis has destroyed several years of progress uh, over the last uh, years. Education, which is a key topic uh, of the model, and same story, unfortunately, uh, a lot of, um, of uh, back, back steps regarding progress we achieved over the last year. So something that we still uh, remain very, um, very careful in terms of our engagement, but also in terms of indicators we are looking for in the, um, looking for in the, uh, in the model. You, show, uh, you already saw a scorecard, a country scorecard. So as I said, this is really the, base of, the basis of the starting point of the discussion uh, we can have. And this is the, the, the quite a summary of uh, the different uh, things we uh, do based on this, um, on this scorecard. So seeking the relevant uh, contacts uh, in terms of with who, explaining the approach, explaining the uh, country scorecard, fostering a further dialogue on the strengths and weaknesses and receive also because it really has to be a mutual uh, exchange of information if you want to be successful in terms of engagement. And finally, and last but not least, inform them about our green bonds uh, and sustainability bonds policy because when we invest in a green bond, we check several things uh, to be sure that this is a real green one. Last part, and I, uh, I think uh, you will um, quickly understand uh, the key points of, uh, of this uh, presentation is how we can measure uh, the success and the impact of our engagement. Uh, first of all, as I said, it will depend uh, a lot on what you engage and finally what's the topic because the expectations are clearly depending on the topics. If you engage on emissions, the the best, uh, the best tool to check if to have a result on the emissions, seeing that these decrease regarding the country and you have uh, aligned uh, with the Paris Agreement. When you, it, when you are in a broad dialogue regarding ESG awareness, I would say you could be already happy if you see a green bond issuance, for example, from Mongolia in the coming months. We could consider that already a success. So it will be very depending on the, on the uh, expectations uh, you have. The, the best timing, is it before, is it between, is it after, we think that you have, as I said, you have to engage as 
often as you have the opportunities uh, to engage. In terms of escalation process, it's less clear than on the uh, corporates. I think that for corporates, you see our engagement, proxy voting, divesting could be interconnected. Here, in terms of sovereign bonds, we are in a totally different situation. Um, you can participate, but that's certainly uh, not, um, not ideal for bond investors on all these uh, climate action. As you can see, uh, class action with a climate affair, as you can see in Netherlands or Belgium or Germany. That's not really um, an opportunity for a bond investor. But divesting uh, would not be a credible way as of today, because I think we are really in the exception of the process, so we have to give time to countries to be more familiar with this kind of, uh, of uh, ESG uh, approach. So the key lights to uh, summarize, uh, as I said, uh, there is a big gap in terms of regulation regarding uh, sovereign bonds and we uh, really uh, find this disappointing because it's a very important asset class, a major financial leverage, a major stable asset class for institutional portfolios. That's the reason why we have to uh, engage, we have to engage for government bonds being sustainable instruments. But that can only be done if it's a, through a rigorous process in in terms of ESG, being sure that you take into account all the different challenges uh, through a disciplined process regarding green bonds and similar through a structural and structured and formalized engagement dialogue and through, of course, uh, the inclusion of the SDGs in your analysis. We have seen with the COVID how the um, on all these progress, uh, unfortunately, have, uh, have been decreased as a result of the lockdowns. So there is still a lot of work to do, and that's the reason why engagement is part also of the, uh, of the, of the global picture. Last but not least, uh, a word I would like to, to make, because maybe it could be uh, an invitation for those online and uh, in the room, is also regarding collaborative efforts. We have a lot regarding corporates, maybe too many initiatives in terms of collaborative initiatives. We have some we, which are very impactful, I think notably about Climate Action 100 Plus. Why not a Climate Action 100 Plus with the countries? So it's a bit an invitation to uh, join the efforts in this, uh, in this first initiation of engagement with countries, because I think there are also a lot to do uh, on this. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ophélie, for this very interesting topic. Are there any questions in the audience? Thank you. Thanks, Ophélie. It was an excellent presentation. And uh, well done to Deepam for the model and daring. That was really great. Could you speak a little bit more about the governance aspect? You had a point on your slide that mentioned governance and how you sort of link that in the discussions about climate and social issues. Yeah, so uh, governance is um, at the beginning in the heart of the model. And governance uh, regarding countries, you could think about, okay, corruption, bribery, like uh, corporates, but you have also all the key questions regarding democracy. So we have several indicators regarding democratic requirements. We have also the key question about empowerment and the uh, place for uh, women and uh, diversity in the different institutions. We have also some indicators regarding the quality and the strengths of the governing institutions. You have also, um, when you think about a sustainable country, a sustainable country is also um, I would say respectful of the international uh, treaties or the international uh, relationships it could have with the different neighborhoods or the different countries. So that's also aspects that we are looking at, uh, this question of international relationships, because that makes part of the governance of country. So um, definitely a key, and as you can see, 
we give exactly the same weight in terms of importance to E, S and G. S is split in two because, as I said, you have the current generation and the next generation. But for us, it's not more important the environment or the climate question on the other challenges because everything is so interconnected that it's very important to uh, give an important uh, weight. And when you are also from a perspective of bond holders and particularly uh, when we launched a strategy uh, in the emerging market, uh, you have to know that there is still a high correlation between the probability to make default and the quality of your institution. So the governance aspect, as typically on the corporate size, governance remains key as well if you want to identify some uh, potential scandals on other questions linked to climate or linked to employees. So. When you know this and when you want to invest in emerging economies and particularly in local currency, the default uh, risk remains an important risk. So it was also very important for us, despite the aspect of ESG impact sustainability, regarding the investments uh, for us, it's also key information to, to have a more informed, better informed decision making process. Thank you. And, and I guess also, in some respects, having conversations with different individuals in emerging market countries, in, uh, in particular about a climate issue or green bond, that can also be, um, a, you can also be discussing the governance elements kind of at the same time or in parallel. Yeah, and we try also to uh, insist a lot on education because uh, we are convinced that next generation is very important. And typically that's for the sustainability of the country. Uh, it's relying on the uh, next generation. So as much as possible, we speak also about education and the quality of education as well. Thank the, you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I would be interested to see what is your um, what is the rate uh, the rating sorry for uh, the U.S. Uh, with your model, and especially if you are taking care of the death penalty, uh, you show us in your uh, presentation that the per capita gas emission for the U.S. was the largest one. But can you exclude such country for sovereign debt? Okay, so very good question. Death penalty is uh, part of the model. Uh, it's not an exclusion criteria as such. Uh, notably, if you look in the emerging economies, you have still a lot of countries uh, where the death penalty is still uh, maybe not applied, but still in the regulation. And when we speak about US, I kindly remind that it's in certain states and not at the country level. So it's included in the model, but it's a binary result. So if you apply the death penalty, at least in your regulation, I do not speak about really implementing it, uh, you, got the, you get the score of zero. And if you, uh, if you are okay, you got a score of 100. So it will impact your result on the total score. Regarding exclusions of the United States, the model is one thing, the engagement is linked to the model and to the scorecards, and afterwards you have the implementation in different strategies. And for your information, we have one strategy in, uh, invested in developed market, which is clearly linked to this model and uh, the sustainable instrument, as I said, with a rigorous ESG screening, which has an impact on the portfolio construction. And for the strategy I'm speaking about, we launched it in 2008, remind this uh, era of sustainable investments. You were really in the era of exclusion and best in class approach. So when we launched the model, first of all, we had to develop everything ourselves because nothing existed. And we decided to do it with a best in class 50%. The United States have never achieved the first half of the model, meaning that for this portfolio, which is not a small portfolio, huh? I think we are at uh, 300 million euro or 400 million euro today. 
uh, US is not eligible because it's still in the bottom and it's nothing to do with uh, Donald Trump something. You have of course the environmental uh, dimensions but the governance we just mentioned, death penalty is a, small, uh, is a small weight in the model but all the questions regarding democracy, regarding uh, freedom of press, regarding empowerment and regarding sense of institution is also a weakness of the United States. So for the moment they are just at the frontier but we dare to not to invest invest when, when we decide investment rules. The same for the case of Russia. Now everybody says, I do not have Russia in my portfolio. When we launched the emerging economies uh, strategies, and once again, it's more than 3 billion assets in the management we have in this strategy. So you see also the Calimero, um, Calimero um, prejudice. We are small, but it's still 3 billion euro in emerging economies. So when a country is issuing a new um, a new bond, we are quite sure that we will be uh, contacted. So we have also weight and voice uh, to make heard. And regarding uh, Russia, so governance was really key for us. And we do not have the legitimacy to say this is democratic, this is not democratic. So we base on NGOs which are recognized as experts on this question. And Russia, since the beginning, and not depending on the result, financial results, is not eligible in this strategy. And at that time, in 2013, I remember it was approximately between 10 to 12 percent of benchmark or peers portfolio. So you have to, to dare, again, uh, daring is a key word, uh, I think, of, uh, of today. You have to dare, um, taking your, your choice regarding ESG impact you want to do as well. Thank you. Thanks again, uh, Ophélie and Dipam, for hosting the session. Thanks to all of you. The, our next session will start at 3, hosted by Intertrust Luxembourg and focusing on unleashing the potential of ESG data in private markets. Thank you. Thank you.